Good question. And if you did not hear him, he's wondering if um, how to help those that their clock doesn't say now, that maybe it says much later or never. Um, because we, we know that there will be the early adopters, like Georgia here, and we'll have others coming along as the process goes. I think the, one of the important factors or comments I could give to you would be that it's not that scary. Most health departments are doing great jobs already and are doing things that can meet those standards. Maybe we just haven't documented them well. We haven't recognized that the work that we are doing fits into the buckets of those standards and measures that are outlined. So I think giving them a little bit of confidence, telling them um, it's, it's doable, bite it off in little chunks. It doesn't have to be done overnight. Um, many health departments have been working on it for years and the ducks were lined up for them to make it an easier process to pass, press go early. There are multiple avenues now for assistance. NACHO, ASTO, even NALBO, they have um, created documents, they've got items on their website that have how to, how to work with a mentor from another health department, best practices that are out there that you can use. I would just put them in touch with some of those other opportunities for pe that people have been successful at and know that it's not as scary as they think it might be. Yes. Hi, Elaine O'Keefe from Yale School of Public Health. Carol, that was a great presentation, and I know it was a long birthing process because I was there around 2002 when I they just it. started talking about this, but I, I, had a, I just had a very practical question, and that is one of the requirements is the community health assessments yes. uh, and as, for local health departments, and as you know, hospitals are becoming very involved in that same process, and I'm wondering if nationally there's been any effort to kind of coordinate that um, we're experiencing some disconnects at the local level. Good question, Elaine. Thank you for that. And absolutely, there's been a lot of movement here. Um, NACHO, again, and ASTO are, are collecting those opportunities. They've been given some funding from our partners, again, to do some model practices, to do some um, evidence-based, you know, to work with a few health departments to collect the data to help the other health departments learn from how they've, they've done this well. We think this is a great opportunity. And for those that have been doing community health assessments for years, which we all should be, um, and if the hospitals haven't been actively engaged, this is such a great, has such great potential for all of us to get on the same boat again. Um, and for the hospitals to step it up just a little in being that critical partner we need them to be in looking at this community health assessment. But yes, our, our, um, our NATO ASTO partners are absolutely working to help the rest of us that are in our chairs at the state and local level and tribal level have examples to use that are best practices. They've also, NATO and ASTO, I know were involved in some of the language tweaks that had gone through the federal government with that 990 requirement. So it's been on our radars for quite some time. Good morning, Carol. Thanks for your presentation. Um, I'm Ruth Weta, KU School of Medicine, Wichita. And <clears throat> I'm a huge believer in accreditation. I've been involved with it since my days in nursing. But I'm wondering from a practical perspective for the health departments that are here, has the board begun the dialogue around how will accreditation possibly be linked to funding? There's, there's been discussion, but I'm just wondering if you can provide any insights from the board's perspective. Thank you. Thank you for that question, um, and that is great. We get asked that quite a lot, actually. Will there be funding opportunities to pay for this? Um, so on, on that side, yes, our partners have been very interested in having discussion and dialogue, CDC um, particularly, on how we can um, work with some of our current contract structures in the future to maybe um, work out some of those details. So um, those discussions are going on. From my personal perspective, and many of you, this is me, Carol speaking only, it shouldn't be about funding. Um, accreditation and doing the right thing 
should be about what we do even if there isn't funding um, specifically attached to this. We, public health needs to be credible and the roadmap that the standards and measures give us show us what we should be doing. It's not, um, it's a stretch for a lot of health departments. It's what we're already doing in a lot of ways that we can do better and document that process better. So it's a huge commitment, I understand that. It's a huge time commitment. But if we wait to say that, well, we can't, can't do it because there's no funding, um, I think that we have missed an opportunity to continue to move the bar forward with public health accreditation and with the, uh, the credibility and the accountability that public health needs with this process. My opinion. Anything else? One more? Good morning. Good morning. I'm uh, Raquel Roberts. I work for Harris County Public Health and Environmental Services. We're one of the local health departments and very much on board with the concept of public health accreditation. Um, like many health departments, we've experienced a lot of um, uh, turbulence, um, a lot of cutback in staff. Mm -hmm. um, the position that we actually had devoted entirely for public health accreditation uh, just this summer was, or not last summer, uh, this past winter was just eliminated. And so the funding, I, I hear your point, the reality is that as much as on board we may be with the concept, um, it's just really difficult. And so I am curious if, uh, well, one, to know um, if there have been many large, medium, small size health departments that have applied, and if you have any numbers um, that suggest sort of the volume of, of applicants, and uh, two, if there's gonna be any efforts that, um, getting to the funding question, um, any efforts to sustain the momentum for those who are able to uh, prepare for accreditation, and also to just stay accredited. Good questions, and I think um, the concerns that you express are, we hear frequently. Um, so don't feel like you're the only one with those anxieties because that is out there, especially with our smaller, smaller health departments. Of the 68 that have applied push go already, it has been across the board. Some really large, some that were beta test sites, some of our small health departments also that were ready and, and capable of doing that. So the, the range has been all um, areas that have pushed the button so far. So we're, we're pleased with that. Um, the sustainability of accreditation, we feel, is there. Now, we also know that it's an iterative process, and we're already looking at the standards and measures to make them clearer and stronger and um, more identified in program focus for the next round. So that it won't be static, whatever we're doing. Um, the funding issue, again, we hear frequently. And how do we do this without funding? So I can tell you a story from my five county health department. I have gone through a 25% decrease in employees in the last five years. My accreditation specialist was eliminated also. Um, I have a, a core small, there's four of us in our management team, and we've decided to pick this up individually and pick up pieces of it and make it happen anyway. There are some creative ways to do that. It just takes a huge, a huge commitment um, to elevate this to one of the need to do, have to do um, activities. That's hard to balance when at a local health department, state health department, we're doing what we have to do, what the, the money we currently have has responsibilities and outcomes for. But I know that we have models through NACHO and ASTO too that, that people are doing this without additional funds. They've maybe been creative in how we circulate staff around and who we re give some responsibilities to. But we are hoping that for those that need that a little extra incentive with some income from, that we can see that happening with um, our CDC contracts and the other opportunities we may have for some funds. Yes. Uh, Henry Montez, I, I'm with the uh, 
APHA and a number of uh, positions, but uh, I'm talking about um, our local health department and our state. I'm in Maryland in Montgomery County, and in both instances, there are umbrella organizations that actually, uh, where our public health activity is nested. Mm -hmm. And um, when you were talking about the use of resources, sometimes the decision isn't at the public health department level, uh, that it's at these other levels, and whether or not decisions uh, are made based on, you know, uh, other criteria than we would use, uh, puts us in a position of having to, if you will, negotiate in terms of where public health is in the scheme of things. So I'm, I guess my question is, how do you take that into account as you do uh, the accreditation process? Thank you for that question. And we, you are not alone. A lot of health departments, and we all look a little different, actually part of those services or the functions are in our community. So when you look at the standards and measures that have been developed and the standard for documenting um, that, that service or that function, we also would expect that you would use the documentation from that partner that you have an MOU with or that you have a contract with. Similar to a centralized state, if the state ha runs the local health departments, those little locals would then be able to use other, the state policies and procedures, for instance, or some of those activities that are covered by someone else. Um, if environmental health is not covered in your jurisdiction but is covered by someone else, it's just the documentation that comes forward that says you understand, you've got a partnership there, um, and that also fits in with the accreditation process. There's a lot of community involvement in a, an accreditation process, um, not just the three prerequisites, but also how we can document the work that we're doing in order to make it qualify for a standard or measure. I think we're ready to move on to our next session. Thank you very much. Oh, oh, we've got one more question. Sorry. Carol, good morning. Excellent presentation. Eduardo Simões of the School of Medicine, University of Missouri. Uh, my question is actually to you and to the partners. Yes. Why not take advantage of the accreditation process? as a unique opportunity for every local health department and state health department to do a self-assessment of the governance, the infrastructure that have been so much damaged over the past few years because of cuts and cuts and cuts. And therefore, when the reapplication process comes from CDC, people could put four or five critical steps based on the evaluation and the assessment done through the accreditation that they would like to push forward with support from CDC on their continuation uh, of contracts for different areas because that's a unique opportunity to identify the critical areas that impede the department to do the right job in the field. It's just a comment. I'd like to hear your opinion on that. Well, it, um, thank you, Eduardo. I think that was um, a good, good question. We, we know that CDC has been very generous with, some of the, with all of the states in giving them NIFI funds, which are improvement funds, to help move that bar. And the, exactly like you said, show us the things that you want to help work on with these funds so that that can advance the program. I think CDC has been way, ad, way ahead of the schedule, way ahead of others in um, offering that support and that sort of um, incentive for the states to start moving in that direction. So I think it's already started. <laughs>